Hello, I'm John Grant and welcome to the next in a series of conversations the Wardley Mapping Community is recording during the run-up to Map Camp London that will take place in October. Before I introduce today's guest, I'm delighted to be joined by Seb Shaw. Hello, Seb. Hi, glad to be back. Good. So, since we last spoke, um, has anything noteworthy caught your attention? Yeah, so the thing I've been looking at in the last sort of week or so is some of the work Adam on the uh, mapping community has been doing with MapScript, particularly looking at uh, trying to figure out where break-even points are, so looking at a way that makes it super easy to see you know, how many cups of tea, to use the example, uh, would we need to sell in order to make our investment back and how that works through. So I can see some really interesting applications for that for some of the work I'm doing with some of my clients talking about whether it's worth renting a service or whether it's worth building something in-house by being able to illustrate that, that break-even point. I think there's some really interesting areas there. There's a few projects on the go about cal calculations of capital mm. flow. So it'd be interesting to see how that develops. Absolutely. I'd like to um, acknowledge Harpit Singh. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's uh, based in Singapore. I believe. Now, Harpreet is the curator of the Wardley Maps newsletter. Um, I find it a really valuable resource. It's clear, uh, well designed, and it's full of uh, interesting quotes, stories, news, maps in the wild. So I would encourage anybody that's listening to sign up to Harpreet's newsletters if you go to twitter and search for mapping maps newsletter so we'll just repeat that mapping maps newsletter and um thanks harpreet and keep up the good work so our guest today i'm absolutely delighted for mark bergauer to take time out of his busy schedule to join us today welcome mark Welcome. Hello. Um, before we start talking about Wardley Maps, tell us a bit about your background and what's your journey been like to where you are today? Um, yeah, okay. How long do you have? I'm, I'm going to do the short version. I'm going to start a fair bit into my life. Okay. Uh, but we'll be very about the early part. So I studied biology, got into the field of complexity, but couldn't see any way to actually go in professional work in a uh, field of complexity and biology that I would have enjoyed. So I grew up in Switzerland and the only jobs I got, job prospects that I got were uh, working for pharmacy and fancy uh, lab life. Um, so I picked up some computer skills while I was a well, I was a teenager in university, so I jobbed around some small little companies, helped them with their, yeah, we want to network, we want, uh, we need to get printers working, so early days of personal computing. Um, then I spent a fair few years of my life as a musician, so something came along and um, lived up music for a while, um, until I met my wife, who's from Scotland, and at some point, um, Having a relationship became more important to me than having fame. And I moved to Scotland with her. Within a few years, um, we started an internet startup. So my computing skills were specialization. So I was a specialist in databases, uh, lots of Oracle work, but I was also an early adopter of Postgres. When the internet came along, obviously I wanted to figure out how can I hook up a database to the internet. So I did internet applications. Uh, from the time even before you have a CGI bin or Perl, so the first stuff was C, etc. Um, but so I had a, a foot in early internet application development, and so I wrote a little thing which later would be termed uh, a content management system in 1999. Uh, my wife, having a solid business background, uh, IT, but mostly sales, marketing, that sort of thing said, I can sell this. So we won an internet competition uh, by Scottish Enterprise. They gave us a little seed funding. 
gave us access to a good bank who helped us a bit. So we started a software startup. Never got actually any VC funding because we were never willing to completely change course. Um, that lasted for eight years. Just about the time we started, um, a friend of mine showed me Ron Jeffrey's XP site. So we ran our company completely following XP Agile principles. I uh, didn't know there was an Agile community around um, in Scotland, so we did this more or less in isolation. But our journey, so the stuff that we learned is what many companies and many people who did early Agile adoption experienced. So uh, at some point, essentially, we ran out of things that we felt was worth having a company. So we had a, a content management system, but then that became a commodity. And there wasn't any market anymore for that. Then we went into community platforms, but uh, so essentially Drupal came along and we thought, yeah, okay, it's not as cool as our software, but it does, it does what it needs to do. And even so we felt we would need to tell our customers they should go that way. And rather than do more pivots, we both felt, yeah, we want to do other things than running a company and being responsible for salaries and, you know, so owning a company teaches you different things than just going and play with exciting tech or like agile with exciting new ways of working. And we wanted to do more of that. Um, my wife built a network and she got a lot of consultancy work and I decided now I want to do large scale organization stuff again. Um, so then did project management uh, job for eight years, basically a large, one of the biggest digital transformation projects around at the time in Scotland, even though at that time, nobody talked about digital transformation um for the nhs um and that experience made clear to me that what i really want to do was agile coaching so for the last four well that's now what is it, five six years i worked as an agile coach so i'm currently working for one of the top five banks in the uk um as a transformation coach so essentially trying to help them not just with the agile but cultural transformations so how do you actually embed better work practices so that includes things like product management devops etc so it's, it's a wide field in terms of practices um that's what i'm currently doing thanks i'd like to come back to agile later on but we're obviously talking about wardley maps here can you recall when you first became aware of Wardley yeah. Mapping? And what aspects of Wardley Mapping have you found most useful, given that broad experience you've just outlined? So I was made aware of Wardley, not just maps, but right away, you need to go and study this person, basically, um, because I think there's more to Simon than just the maps. Um, especially if you then start to get a bit of an understanding of his own journey um, by Marcus Andretzak. So he's a product, I would say product guru, but he doesn't like that word and who does, who is really uh, a knowledgeable person, deep knowledgeable person of products. So he came across it and started telling me about it. And then he started tweeting about it and trying now to remember, I think that must have been about 2000, 15 or 16, somewhere thereabouts. And I think probably like many people who initially come to Wardley Maps from this kind of angle, as in not directly, not knowing Simon, not being exposed to Simon or anybody who works in his sphere. It took me quite a while to really understand why I need to invest the time in the learning. So you look at it first and there are things that you said, that's quite cool, that's quite, interesting to look at um but unless you actually go i think through the whole journey that also simon lays out to you for example in his book that's some medium etc that you actually put together the puzzle with sun tzu and uda loop and all the other ingredients that are in there then i so i i couldn't see how i could use it how i could apply it it was a bit too big for me at the time yeah so i i had a hunch it's valuable but I couldn't, I couldn't sell it to anybody else. I would have, yes, I tried, I think, a couple of times to get people I was working with enthused about it and realized 
you know, if you can't explain it, then you know you don't understand it well enough yet. And so that was that phenomenon. And so I took a, a step back and started spending the time studying the things that Wardley is, is mentioning and quoting and encourages you to, to study. So you can listen to his, to his talks, but a one hour conference talk even is still far too quick to get through the knowledge. And at that time, there was no book. There were unorganized blog posts on his original site, and it was up to you to find the ones that help you get sort of the next step of the learning curve, etc. And I think I spent probably half a year, year just whenever I had a bit of spare time, as I would read other books, actually just go and read blog posts. And only over time, I felt comfortable enough to say, okay, I think now I understand it. And then my litmus test was, at the time, I was helping Chris McDermott with organizing Lean Out of Scotland. And I wanted us to invite Simon to come and speak. And that was the litmus test. Could I sell it to Chris? And I could. And so we invited him and gave him a keynote. Um, I'm not sure we were the very first, but I think we were still early in the agile, lean agile world, embracing worldly maps and saying, here's something community you need to pay attention to. Um, in terms of actually using it for my work, um, so as I got better and my understanding got deeper, I did actually manage to use it in a few places, just normal maps. But the thing that excites me uh, most now is that it's actually the concept of mapping. It's what he says about what makes a map. Anchor, position, movement, okay, visualization, but most maps are, et cetera. There are a few other elements, but I think it's the anchor, position, movement that we, that we need to be conscious about when we talk about maps. Um, so there are other areas of knowledge work where I think we are missing maps. Um, and so I'm trying to, develop ideas. So there's Chris McDermott's uh, maturity mapping where I'm involved in. So I'm a bit his sounding board whenever he comes up with ideas or occasionally I have an idea for maturity mapping. Um, so I'm working with him, trying to help him develop the idea. But uh, equally, I'm, I'm, there are other areas and I might, you might need to tickle me whether I really want to talk about them because I'm not nearly these things are not nearly mature enough that I think they're worth sharing. And so they're in the social space. So I think we have big problems in understanding the social environment in large organization in a way that actually allows us, if, if, if you want to go to the point, change culture. So the way you change culture is not, is not by doing, I think, tricks on people to change their behavior. I think the way of culture is you make people aware of what the social environment is so that they can start making better relationships in the organization they're in to progress their work, to get better results from their work, etc. So it is what Simon talks about. It's about situational awareness, but so I'm interested in how can we make maps work in a social context. Um, and I think the reason why I also want to be reluctant what I do in gory detail is because there's also a bit of more risk and danger in that. So Simon tweeted a few months ago something about he figured out how to do social capital as a map and I will die to see what he's doing but he also said he's not going to share it and I haven't had a chance to talk to him about but if his experience is a little like mine then he probably is reluctant to make this available because yeah, so all of these things can be used for good as bad equally, but when it goes to the social space, then if it's used badly, there can be probably a lot of harm. And so hence, even though I have some ideas how we could do things like social capital, and I do not kid myself that there will be as good assignments, but since he's not sharing, I'm left to my own speculation. But I do try to come up with other things that hopefully I can mature to the point that they're useful and not quite as delicate or risky or dangerous. So I'm trying to use worldly mapping techniques or ideas in a social space, but for people to have conversation about what kind of relationships they want to have. Let's say, for example, you're a team, they were in a large organization, there are people or functions in the organization you want more interactions and better and 
maybe more co-creating interactions with, and there might be other that you would wish, no, no, give me just direction. Don't make me come and sit through three hour meetings. Um, we don't need that level of interaction. So allow teams to become more aware of what kind of relationships they want to foster and what kind of relationships they're okay with or they can tune back a bit. Make this more explicit and, and transparent. Okay, at this stage, we normally start to think about asking of any perceived limitations of mapping, but I'm not gonna go down that route just now because I thought from what you've just said and given your background, I'd like to zoom out a bit, um, look at things from a broader perspective. So this year is the 30th anniversary of the invention of the World Wide Web. Uh, 1989, Tim Berners-Lee and his colleagues at CERN. It's also, I think, 18 years since the publication of the Agile Manifesto. Um, and I think commentary around that time of the principles of Agile were the, the the agile methodologies were about the, I think it's the mushy stuff of values and culture. So what I'd like to ask you, Mark, is your thoughts and opinions on what's changed over the last 18 years and has there been any development in the methods and practices that have had a positive impact on communication, collaboration, learning, including organizational learning, but in particular, um, in your opinion or in experience, have you seen anything that's improved the well-being of agile teams and knowledge workers in general? So that's a multifaceted question. So I probably will go into rant and you might, I welcome you to stop me and pin me to things you really think we need to yep. explore. Um, you, rant. Okay. you rant away. Yes. So everybody who follows me on Twitter will know I'm pretty opinionated about what's happening in the Agile space. And so the overwhelming worry that I have these days, or for me, that's no longer a worry. That's now, um, that's now a given. Um, so we have, we have this concept of novel ideas, and Wardley uses that, that have to cross a chasm. Um, so Agile has crossed the chasm, but also where we learn often when things cross the chasm, some of the intentions of its originators also get lost. Uh, the commercialization, for, for, for example, of Agile in principle is, is a, for me, it's a betrayal of the manifesto. So if we were trying to make money out of that in itself, I always was suspicious of people trying to do that. Sorry, um, but that's how the world works. So um, I'm less and less trying to make that stop or reverse or prevent or any of that, but just accept it. I would expect in two or three years, what people generally will understand as agile will be an articulation from Accenture or McKinsey. It will be no longer from the people who wrote the manifesto will no longer be Kent Beck's books or Ron Jeffrey's blogs. It will be what the big consultancies say Agile is. And I see that already working in large organizations over the last few years. When I go and work with new teams, that's, that's their, their, their understanding of Agile. They might have read the manifesto, but have no idea how the manifesto links to the things that they get taught on a Scrum course uh, by a professional trainer who never did Scrum. So, that's the world within Agile. However, if you get teams um, to really still live um, real Agile team culture, and this is where I start to shy away from Scrum and go back to XP. So I, I have the experience that I work with teams that I get to the point that they're really doing XP well, and then you also see the cultural shift. So getting their work cycles uh, to fast feedback loops, get the, the, the social culture of pairing and being transparent about problems and swarming and helping each other and sharing the knowledge 
that they acquire. So not just developers, but working equally in a collaborative way with the testers, with the analysts, with the designers, etc. You can see the difference in the team culture. So I'm not quite sure whether it's the right people in the right team that are willing to, so they have the right disposition as people and hence they embrace XP better than others and make it work. I think there is a fair bit in the XP that actually helps them to get to the culture. And so this is as, as an agile person where I start to shift my focus. So I think agile was very good over the last, what is it now? You said nearly 20 years um, that agile is around. Um, coming up with engineering stuff. Yeah, how we build code, how we make code better in terms of quality, how we improve, improve code design. We need the DevOps to tickle us to start thinking about, okay, your code lives in an operational environment. You should start making releasing and testing easier and operating easier. Um, but all of these things always seem to have a tendency that what gets popular is what we can do technically. And Agile and DevOps both have very strong articulations that talk about the social things. And I think they usually get dropped, they get ignored because they're hard. You can relatively, sorry, in comparison, you can teach somebody in a structured way how to do TDD. Um, I'm no fan of Bob Martins, but Clean Code made that case. Yeah, people, I know people who just watch Clean Code videos, learned how to do TDD suddenly ended up in a team that did TDD and didn't feel like I am light years behind them, yeah? But you can't learn to teach collaboration that way. You can't teach pairing, um, mob programming. These are things that you actually have to do with a team. You have to go and practice them. And I think Agile was relatively bad in equally emphasize the need to work on these things People will say it all the time, but what, when you go to conferences or stuff like that, what you get delivered is the stuff that we can pack into a recipe. Here is something we can show you in a one hour talk. You can go try it and do when you're back at your farm. That's recipes. And I believe that that tendency to push the recipes, the, the thing that's quantifiable rather than qualifiable, has enabled um, the commercialization of Agile to go so quickly and so smoothly. Because effectively, what do these people do? They just, if you look at SAFE, what has it done? It picked up all the recipification. Everything else in SAFE is still all command and control structure. They have not given anything new, how you manage, how you incentivize people, how you overcome communication difficulties and stuff like that in a team, etc. SAFE has nothing to say about that. Or if it pretends to say, then it doesn't say anything new, which is why large organizations love it because they say, oh yeah, manage, management structure fits perfectly into that. The only thing you have to change is engineering culture. I think that's, I'm, I'm in, sorry, Seb, go on. So I think that's a really interesting and insightful perspective on that of the, the focus on what can be packaged, which is very much against the manifesto. It's against the entire purpose of it. But it's also, as you say, it's very appealing. It's a, we can take this in and we don't need to change because we are, you know, we know what we're doing, but all of those people working under us, they can change and then we'll get a lot of benefit from it. So that is also exactly what I experience when I start working with people at senior level is that it's, it's not that they don't want to change. It's that the way they learned about Agile, it's a team thing. It's a programmer thing. Yeah. yeah. And I answered a little bit recently on Twitter that I said, we need to get away from that. We need to get away from treating Agile as a software development thing. And there are some very more credible Agile proponents than me, like uh, Michael Hill, G for Hill, who says similar things as this. We have to start to understand software is a part of tendering to people's needs. And as long as we're only, as, as long as we treat the software thing as the thing we can package away, we can't be surprised that enterprises or any kind of, of hierarchical culture will just focus on that. So mm. I senior managers now, sometimes exec, 
And what I realize is I'm better not talking agile, even if in my head it's people and interactions over process and tools at the forefront all the time, I better not mention agile because as soon as I use the word agile, they talk about code and teams and who produce code, not even teams who run code, never mind designers or uh, researchers, researchers, ethnographers, and all the things that we know now we need in good software companies or software areas. So one area I'm interested in, Mark, is the future of work and looking at it, the, the impact that automation, robotics, machine intelligence is going to have yeah. and how we're going to have to adapt as a society to these rapid technological changes. One phrase that I appreciate this is very simplistic, but it does make sense to me when I'm looking at what I should follow or look at next is rather than teach people what to think, it's teach people how to think. And I think worldly mapping for me is good for that. It gives you a kind of scaffolding or a set of guide rails to look at the world and map the landscape and apply climactic patterns and doctrine. Uh, you can also use I think what Simon calls phenotype mapping, which is looking at companies that are judged on the, the bits that you can observe, you can make assumptions and map what you think they're going to do next. Um, this is a, an open-ended question, but maybe just if it's your top three or what, what priorities in your mind, what changes need to occur to Agile? moving forward. So I actually want to stop thinking about that because I think that battle is lost. So I think mm -hmm. Agile will be, so Agile as a term, what people recognize, etc., will be what the big consultancies are making it right now. Um, this is also supported by quite a lot of people, so this is how I look at it, in the Agile world, happily selling out to them, happily go and give the credit that they earned in a community early on. So we have the Agile Coaching Institute sold out. They said, oh, we're gonna make sure Accenture is not gonna do any of these miserable things and all these miserable things not only happen still, they happen even louder now. So this packaging, recipification, and oh yeah, if you need culture change, then here's how you have to intimidate your uh, employees to change behavior. All of these things Accenture is doing now with, hey, we have agile cred because we have these people on board. So I think it is, for me, it is new to think about what do, does need to happen for agile to change. What I'm thinking about is which area of knowledge work, if you want, or management or social aspects are interesting to improve how the work works. So for me, for example, wordly mapping is not an agile thing. Wordly mapping is something that works exceedingly well. We, I think we all agree then in the technology space, but Simon already shows us that you can use mapping even in non-technology space and other business areas. I believe, I'm pretty sure he's mapping politics, even though I haven't seen him sharing that because it's a cognitive tool. It is a way how we as a group can map something together so we can share our understanding of our environment in a way that also allows us to talk about action, observe action and correct our picture. So it's a cognitive tool that helps us understand the world, which we need to do as a group, not as individuals, because it's too complex to figure out and how we can actually also, so the real value of the map is that we can check with one another that we still have a coherent picture of what's going on. And when we're talking about certain things that, yeah, we mean the certain same things. Without things like map and so on, often we might use the same words, but we have different models in our heads. And in some areas, that's good. John Oswell makes a big point about when we talk about uh, IT systems, that it's actually good that different people have different models because these are different lenses on the complex system. But when we talk, when we want to talk about strategy or other things where alignment is important, Having something like a map and making sure we really mean the same thing when we say these things 
is a super valuable tool. But for me, worldly mapping isn't an advancement of agile. Worldly mapping is something that came from a other field and it helps us with making the work better. So yeah, I'll happily use it and, and support it and praise it. So cognitive tools is perhaps another way of talk. What I was talking about is teaching people how to think rather than what to think. Yes. So two questions here. One is at the moment, just talking about today, which is more useful or valuable to you uh, with regard to worldly mapping? Is it the collaborative side of it where you can challenge groups can challenge assumptions? Everybody yep. has a say, or is it the, the other end, which is a strategic gameplay. Are there really different things? So, <coughs> excuse me. So what is strategy? Okay, so I would say usually if you want to know what strategy, go read Simon. But I have an, an additional thing. So strategy is actually articulate an intent of changing from where we are to, towards where we want to go. Um, and that's actually, so that is the purpose of work. Or that's why so work itself is solving. So Esco Kilpi uses a quote, but I can't remember who his quote is or Paul Tim, but it says, work is solving other people's problems. So once we accept, we understand what other people's problems are, and I'm not saying that is an easy problem to solve, but I would say that's product management and we're probably not gonna talk about that today. Um, but once we understand roughly what is the user need that we're trying to achieve, um, given that these user needs are so complex, we can't solve this on our own, we have to work together. We need, even at a team level, even at a low, we need some strategic intent how we think we're gonna make that happen, yeah? How do we make this? How do we get from where we are, where the problem is still a problem, to where we, in a state where that problem actually no longer is experienced as a problem by the user, rather something that's now satisfying and working? That is, even at a small level, even at a team level, when it comes to how do we do code design, etc. There are strategic decisions made at all these levels. So a team, a team sitting down and mapping, for example, all the practices they're doing in order to satisfy user needs, and then being deliberate about which practices do we need to get better at to better satisfy these user needs, that is a strategic decision. So team becoming aware of their environment and mapping, their tech stack, etc. The reason you do this is so you can move forward with intent. And if we talk about organizational strategy, then that's just intent at a higher level of granularity, at a longer time span, et cetera. But in, it's all about intentionality. So how can we move and act with intent, which in this context also means we all know, or it allows us all to move in the same direction and not have misunderstandings about what we want to do so that even though we say we all, want to achieve an outcome, practically we start to get into each other's way and pulling in different directions and etc. So the, you can't sa separate strategy from the collaboration, they're, they're, they're one and a whole together. If you're, go if you're mapping something, you're obviously thinking about intention and strategy at the same time. It, um, so if you go back to methodologies or frameworks which complement worldly mapping and i'm thinking about systems thinking or the viable system model or Kadepin. is there anything that's on your radar or you must apply at the same time i assume you probably having a hunch of what's coming so yeah i would have mentioned Kinevin. um so i'm a bit i'm a bit iffy about the term system thinking and one of the reasons I'm iffy about is because system thinking at its very beginning, so it comes a little bit of cybernetics, but what irks me about it is that a lot of people out there claiming system thinking, but when they think about system, they still think machines. They think usually complicated machines, if I want to use Kinevin terminology, they don't think complexity. They still think ultimately, um, system thinking tools will let us control these things, will let us predict these things. So I'm, I'm coming from biology. I understood 
before I understood Knevin, um, so my fascination with complexity was it explains emergence. So reductionism's problem, um, empiricism, etc. It, it can't explain emergence. Complexity can. System thinking seems to ignore that quite often. So there are people who run under the banner of system thinking. They're really complexity thinkers, and they're great. But equally, there's a there's a whole lot of things happening under system thinking where I say, no, no, that's just complicated. That's still assuming. Let's say if we get just 500 million times the computing power we have now, then we can solve this computing problem. We can solve this problem with calculations. So an example is chess. Um, and it's not my example, I like the example. Um, Kasparov was beaten not by a computer, but by a computer that was sort of compiling the knowledge of, I don't know how many dozen experts, and here we have chess. So, it was fed by chess experts, by people, even behavioral. It was a whole psychologist. There was a whole host of experts that fed the data. Yeah. And the Cupid, Cupid was just capable of making sense, in a sense, of the data quickly enough that they could keep up with Kasparov. Well, would we still think it's a great achievement? He said, OK, you have a, a team of 100 or 200 chess experts, and they could operate at 10,000 or 100,000 or a million times the speed of Kasparov. So he only had a second and then they could go away and think about the thing for two, three years and come back with it. Would we still have been surprised that they beat him? No, we wouldn't. Would we have called that a miracle? No. Would we have called that a, a feat of knowledge management? Not even that. Because there is this machine that we can intersperse, and IBM is very good at the propaganda and the marketing of that, suddenly we say a computer beat has beaten Kasparov. Yeah. And that points to me also to, I think you wanted to ask that earlier, um, cognitive tools. There's a very interesting experiment that uh, a scientist called Nicholas Christakis uh, has run. Um, he's, people who know me will know I quote him a lot. He's a leading network scientist, um, where he introduced bots in knowledge work networks. Um, but he introduced stupid bots. He calls it dumb AI, yeah? Because his assumption is we need technology to augment what humans do, not replace. And so he introduced dumb AI because network science or his network um, research said, if I have the right kind of noise, the network will become better. And that was the outcome. So he gave people um, cognitive knowledge work to do um, but introduced bots, so they were just talking to each other through networks, network communication, and he introduced bots, and the people even didn't know they were bots. Um, I think in the early experiments, they, say, they just thought these are dumb people that participate in this work. But the dumbness sort of had, had the effect that you had to be more explicit. And I'm not sure I interpret this right because I haven't, he hasn't published yet the underlying research in a way that I could access it. It's behind paywalls and I'm not paying that much money for it, um, given that I'm not really working in that field. But if I understood how he explains it and talks in his book, um, it is a little bit like you go into a difficult meeting with lots of knowledge problems and uh, intrinsic expertise being required, and you help this team of people actually making progress by asking the really dumb questions. The dumb question that everybody thinks everybody knows exactly, but suddenly they have to explain it to you, the dumb laddie, as we call it in Scotland, and then they realize, oh, we don't mean the same thing when we explain this. We don't have the same explanation of this thing. And this is again where mapping comes in. If we visualize this, this is where we start to, oh, you put this into product, I would have to put that into Genesis, or now I put it into commodity. But if we don't do this sort of thing, if we don't have the dumb question, if we don't have the tool that provokes the right conversation, and that's where I has to come in in my book, then we actually don't realize that we're not having the same perspective, that we do, that we see these things differently, and we're not benefiting from these multiple angles of looking at it. Because even if you put something on a world map in, in commodity, for example, if it's a slightly complex thing in itself, it will have elements which are in Genesis. It will have, which is what Wordy says, you explode the node and suddenly you have a new map. 
This thing as a node itself is a commodity. But as soon as you explode it into its components, you will realize somewhere, okay, maybe not Genesis or its really component, but it will be spread over the map. It will not all be in commodity. So, so can, I, yeah, can I please reflect back on what you said there and say that worldly mapping is an enabler of collective yes. intelligence? Yes. So I would actually question, other than as a practice of exercise, that mapping on your own is useful. And so, for example, I reject so far, I've seen a few attempts of other maps, build on worldly maps. As soon as they say, you can't share this with others, you lost me. So I think that's a crucial part of a map is, and this is true for geographical maps, if you study how, so I'm from Switzerland, so I learned in school how Swiss, the Swiss, the famous Swiss maps are built. They're not built by single people. And the quality from the map comes from several people having different ideas. How would you now illustrate, visualize this area? And they discuss this idea, and it's the overlap of various perspective that in the end create a map that when we look at it and try to make sense of a geography, can pick out things that actually really help us. Some of the symbolism that you find on the map might not work for you, but it might work for your wife, yeah? And together, oh, look, we'll find our way through this jungle because we have a useful map. It is a social tool. Yes, yeah. It's an interesting thing to say. Hmm. Well, let's say that's why I value it so much. Before we wrap things up then, um, I'd just like to dig a little bit deeper and go back to the point you made about emergence and try and understand what your influences are. So if you had a time machine and you could go back to a younger mark, what two books would you suggest your younger self read these sooner rather than later? And you can be fiction, non-fiction, whatever. Um, I'm not sure I can entertain that exercise because I sort of think I read the books at the time when I was ready for them and if I would have read them earlier I probably wouldn't have been ready for them. Um, maybe I could have read, if somebody would have pointed out to me, Alicia Horrera's Dynamics in Action a bit earlier than I did. Um, but I think I probably would have wanted to read it even before she wrote it. So if I want to say if you want to have two books which were pivotal to get me thinking in these manners, in these terms, etc. Um, and I still think it's a good book. I would just say maybe with hindsight, just read the first part. It's Eric Fionch's uh, The Creative Universe or The Self, uh, sorry, in English it's called The Self-Organizing Universe and you will have to go to rare books. He was a philosopher working alongside Priogin uh, Maturana, etc. He was in this circle, but um, I think his way of illustrating complexity is more accessible to people who have no background in biology, cognitive science, or any of it, because I read it as a 17 or 18 year old, grappling at that time still with, okay, I grew up very religious, and maybe this God stuff is maybe not really working for me, but and it got me over the edge. It literally gave me the thing that said, ah, this makes sense. Now the world starts to make sense again to me, yeah? So it was a pivotal book, and it's the reason I studied biology. Um, it's probably the reason I am where I am now and never let go of this complexity thing, even when I did music, and that has very little to do. But in hindsight, for example, now also use my creative years experience to understand uh, how that, plays into complexity. So Erich Jansch's um, The Self-Organizing Universe, if you're a beginner of complexity, or if you want to explain complexity to people. He has lovely examples galore. But the second part, um, it was interesting at the time he wrote it when a lot of these things were not yet explored. I think it didn't date quite as well. And as I said, Alicia Horaire's Dynamic in Action, Dynamics in Action, because I think that's Okay, it's a philosophy book, and obviously it's tough to read in some aspects, but it, it starts, it is that book that has maybe finally got me away from what I call the objective, the objectiveness of things. 
um, to the relationship, so focusing on relationships. So the quote that we're using in our community from her is meaning is in, uh, meaning exists in the interaction of things, not the things themselves. And one of the things I learned as an agile coach, you can, ex you can exchange meaning, for example, with value. If you want to understand value creation, you have to look at the interaction of people or teams, organizations, consumers. The value creation happens in the interaction, not in the product as you put it on a shelf, not the product as it's ready to consume. The value is in the consumption. Again, Esco Kilpi can help you with that and has some very good blog posts on that. If you want one more influence, strong influence currently on me, then it's Cameron Tompkin Wise, who's a design professor currently in Australia, but also on Twitter, um, has published quite a few things that you can download for free, so research paper, etc. Um, so this is design, or then his student and my friend Jay Bloom, but at the moment you have to go go to conference talks. That's the only way he's currently sharing his work because he's working on a PhD and we're all desperate to read his PhD when it comes out. And probably you should read that when you can. So we've covered, I think, quite a, a lot of different disparate subjects here. If people want to stay tuned in to you, Mark, how can they do that? I follow you on Twitter. I know you're there. Do you have a blog or <laughs> no? Twitter. Twitter it is okay. for the moment, but um, if Twitter is not your thing, um, do enough Twitter to DM me. If, if, so the, I use, if you follow me and your profile reads like you vaguely in my professional space or in a space I find interesting, then I will follow you back. So if you say something about the future of work, Although I think we should start using, so Jay made us aware that we should not focus on the future, but on the present. So I would say, let's not wait for the future for the work to become better, but the present of the work to become better. Um, but if you follow me on Twitter and your bio has anything that's related to me, I will follow you back. You can then DM me and then we can talk about what kind of um, exchange you would prefer. So I'm happy to do email, happy to do Skypes or Zooms or it's just, that's the only channel I'm currently publicly visible. Okay. Well, I'd like to say a big thanks to Seb Shaw for joining me today. And thank I'd you. I'd like to say a big thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Mark. Is really insightful. And mm. um, I really appreciate taking the time out to speak to us today. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, bye-bye.